So good evening, everyone. What a pleasure to see you all. And I love the familiar faces here and very recently now familiar after the last few minutes, last half an hour, 45 minutes. So uh, I am honored by your presence. Uh, and I want to begin by uh, acknowledging the wonderful work of the folks at Brooks Memorial Library led by their fearless leader, Star Electronica, who is here. Star, wherever you are, you're in your office. Hi, Star. Yes. She can't see it or see it. Uh, yeah, she was the one. Yeah, she's like. So a few other folks. Um, Matthew Wojcik is the person who helped set all this up. He's at Electronic Services. Seth Thomas is the Brattleboro uh, Communications Director, and the wonderful and talented and committed Maria Dominguez is the our most. Celebrated videographer, always an honor to have her here. And I'm touched that we have so many celebrities in the house tonight, and you know who you are, so I'm thrilled. So, you know, one of the things I love about, about teaching is that, of course, I learn a lot. And um, I feel that I am just a lifelong student of life. And I just love the fact that for my whole adult life, I've been able to explore what it means to, you know, what my life is about and what the world is about. And, you know, um, again, just very briefly, so, you know, I'm a Buddhist priest. You probably got something about that with the outfit on. Uh, I'm a political science professor is my sort of what I've been doing for a long time. And so I'm interested in obviously the sort of Buddhist practice and so forth, and also the politics. And in many ways, the thing that brings them together is the issue of suffering in the world, you know. And, you know, why do people suffer? Um, what can be done about it? And there is the suffering that comes from internally, our own lives, if you will, our own imagination, what we create. And then there's the real suffering that exists due to institutions and systems, social, political, economic systems, over which we often have absolutely no control, and in addition to the weather and other things. So there are both the external and the internal pieces there. And so for me, you know, delving into Buddhism as a spiritual practice, as a way to understand the world, and to look at the issues of suffering in the social realm, to me is a, is a very powerful well to, way to make sense of this life. And so, you know, for me, bringing the two of them together um, provide insight into really what's going on. And here's the question, you know, this is the third talk that I'm giving. <clears throat> I'll very briefly summarize the first two in a second. But I always ask the question when I prepare for something like this or just in my life, what is this really about? You know, what is this talk about? It's about Buddhism and it's about politics. Well, what is it really about? I mean, those are like, you know, Buddhism is this whole sort of historical, religious, social, you know, phenomenon. Uh, politics is, a, again, a whole other, you know, domain of, of life. And, and the question I have in 2022 is, how do we move forward in the United States of America, in the world, given the problems that are facing us. And, you know, part, and I don't have to sort of <laughs> explain the problems around global warming and all the rest of it. <clears throat> you all know that. The question I have, how do we get to a place where we're actually being constructive in the world? And that often means from a political perspective. And I spend much of my time in, uh, as a political scientist looking at the very question of why a president or a leader makes the decision that they do. Why did Putin invade the Ukraine? You know, at the time it may seem like a good idea for him. He's not a dumb guy altogether, but this may have been, an, for just from a purely political point of view, forget about the humanitarian piece. You know, why does uh, Donald Trump do things? Why did George W. Bush, Barack Obama, why do they make that decision? It's always been the question I've been asking myself. 
and given the sort of, you know, we are in this existential challenge. The world, you know, and again, it's easy to romanticize how things work. The level of suffering in the world on a sort of daily basis is less than ever. And now that, you may find that shocking and may think I'm nuts. But there are a number of books who go through the statistics, the level of poverty, the number of wars that are taking place in the world. You go down all the sort of indicators of suffering. The fact is things are actually better than they ever have been, ever. You know, people live into their 80s. That's an indicator of the wellness that of their lives. It wasn't that long ago that nobody lived, that the average you know, lifespan was 40 years. Like in the whole world over, 40 years. Some died at you know, birth, others lived long. The question I have that I'm asking at the root of this undertaking here is do we need a spiritual approach? to the problems that confront us. Is that the only way, ultimately, we are going to address the reality of the existential crisis we're in? And I'm talking about the environment and everything that sort of like feeds into that. We live in an ideology, and I'll get to this in a bit. <clears throat> and so here's the question. Do we need a spiritual foundation, a spiritual message is that the only way to break through denial, resistance, ego? And if so, what does that spiritual message contain? So the book I'm writing is on Buddhism and American politics. I'm developing this sort of model, if you will, of Buddhist approach to politics, beginning with the Buddha right through folks like the Dalai Lama today. So this is this huge history. Various leaders have different opinions about how to approach it. They're not that different, actually, even across the centuries. And then I'm applying that sort of set of Buddhist principles to things like poverty, global warming, racism, sexism, classism, all the rest of it. Violence, criminal justice. <clears throat> and so the question I'm having, is this spiritual message embodied, from my understanding of Buddhism, or what we call the Buddha Dharma, the teaching of the Buddha. Is that one way to try to penetrate the sort of the resistance and the obstinance that keeps our institutions in many ways committed to this policy of self-interest or what we can call selfishness and greed? And do we actually, what is it going to take us to move from this ultra-individualism to a more socially conscious commitment in our lives, the fact that we're actually able, willing to share. I have a lot of, I'm not saying I do, but if I have a lot of money, am I just sort of understanding, it's, do I keep it, do I have any responsibility? You know, Margaret Thatcher, a lot of conservatives loved her because she said, there's no such thing as society. And that's just about to quote, there's no such thing as society, and what she's basically saying is, do whatever the hell you want, you don't have to worry about anybody else, even though it's everybody else who may help you make you know, the roads and brought you your food and cooked your food and have the electricity. You rely on everyone else to be that radical individual. And so I wonder, I wonder, and again, this whole project was to see what Buddhism has to say, and this is the question. Thank you so much for coming. Coming, Rachel, such a pleasure. Your child is just gorgeous. My God, what a darling. Uh, the question is, you know, what does Buddhism bring to politics, if anything? Buddhism, 2,500 years old, and here we are in the 21st century. Where's my iPhone? You know, we're living in di very different worlds. The iPhone, really. It's a miracle. And here's the thing. The iPhone is a miracle. The question is, our sort of technological development, the advances that we've made externally, in society, with our knowledge, with the resources of the world. The real question to me is, what kind of internal technology do we have to deal with our lives? Frustration, 
anger, jealousy, resentment, all of those emotions that plague us and also make us act in unkind ways toward others. Violence, you know, James Gilligan, the great psychologist who's been working with guys on, in prisons forever, for 40 years. He basically says is that the root of violence, you know, he's talking to all these guys. I volunteer in the prison up in Springfield, so I work with these guys. These are lovely, most of them are lovely guys. They're just like, they're no different than I am. They just had circumstances that were very different than my circumstances. But James Gilligan says, basically what it comes down to is that they feel shame. They've grown up in places that have shamed them. And the only way they can have any sense of themselves, any agency in the world, is through violence. There's this great quote I remember from his book. He says, he's talking about this guy who murdered a bunch of folks. And he's in prison, he goes, I never felt so powerful in my whole life as when I had a gun at someone's head. For the grace of God, personally, I don't need a gun at someone's head to feel okay about myself. Shame. I mean, just think of all of the factors that go into this fellow's life that he's going to kill someone in order to feel good about himself. The point being, <clears throat> can a spiritual approach to politics, number one, will it fly? And what might that look like? And the interesting thing about this last few months, and I've been working on this book, this reading, I really haven't written much at all because I've been reading about Buddhist history for like over the years is that the whole topic has been Buddhism and politics. And what I've come to is the fact that there is this idea in Buddhism of, you know, one of my teachers, Bernie Glassman, he always talked about the one body. He basically says, we are one body. I mean, literally, all of us. We are one body. And he talks about spirituality as the both recognition and understanding of the one body. And the idea is that, you know, if our left arm is bleeding, we put pressure on it, we put a band-aid because it's our left arm, it's us. If we get to a point of non-separation between ourselves and others, between ourselves and nature, that, and again, I've been reading a lot about the Big Bang Theory, the beginning of the universe. This is heavy stuff. I mean, talk, you know, the good Buddhist man just loves this stuff. 14 billion years ago, the Big Bang, they got it down to 13.9 billion. Four billion years on the Earth, all this stuff just coming together and cools and molten ash. And then all of a sudden there's life because of this electrical And what I'm coming to understand is that there is this real unity from the beginning of this universe. Again, this is like, I'm talking the last three or four months, reading sort of extensively this whole literature about the beginning of the universe. And it fits so neatly into the Buddhist perspective of this one body. And so the idea is that, you know, your left arm hurts, you attend to it. If, in fact, we live as one body in this world, when someone else is suffering, of course we tend to it, just like we tend to our own self, because, in fact, there is no separation. And from my practice of meditation and mindfulness practice is really trying to live that life of non-separation with others. If it's my beloved wife, 40 years, I adore my children out some club five or shortly, were people I just met. I met this beautiful guy, Greg, you know, and uh, the fact that um, Amy is here as well. I mean, what a just blessing of the first order. And so the question is, in politics, from a Buddhist perspective, it's the fact that there is us and them. 
and it begins in our head. Our mind is here, and then there's like the world out there. And ideally, over time, through a meditation practice, through a mindfulness practice, it doesn't have to be that, in my opinion. It could be music, walking in the woods, whatever it may be, exercise. Being totally present, totally here, totally just this, just this. The miracle of the beautiful little boy, just there. And so from a political perspective, can we, is there a technology, if you will, that we can incorporate, embrace, so that there is not the separation? You know, how many times have I heard folks say, I'm not going to pay taxes so that guy can like, send his kids to school. I don't have any, you know, I used to be on the school board. I'm not going to spend taxes so that kid, you know, I don't have any children. Why the hell am I going to do it? I'm not going to spend my money so someone else has health insurance and they are, they're, you know, they don't take care of themselves. Why am I going to do that? And I understand that, you know. Uh, I understand. And that's a tough one to respond to, I think, especially when that person's life is a life of struggle. A life of real pain and suffering. You know, the fact is, is that they've closed themselves because, I mean, it's, it's painful. You ever been cold outside? I mean, like not have a place to stay at night? It's brutal. I mean, how can you be open if you're literally freezing on the streets of Vermont? How can I be, am I going to be generous? I'm literally getting to hold my hands. How can I open them? So here's the question, and again, it, you know, this is the, one of the interesting little developments in the last, literally the last month or so in doing these different talks, is that I've gone from Buddhism and politics to Buddhism and all the other spiritual and religious traditions, and to be looking at the mystical component, if it's, um, you know, the Sufis or, um, what am I saying, Shabbalah, the, uh, What's the Jewish mystic? Um, ha, the Kabbalah. Kabbalah. The Kabbalah. I'm saying Shabbalah. No, it's Shambhala. It's the Buddhist crowd. The Kabbalah is the mystical tradition. Or the Sufis, whatever they may be. Or the, you know, the different mystics in Hinduism. Or the mystics Thomas Merton in the crowd in, in, in the Catholic Church. And, you know, there's this notion that's called interspirituality. This was brand new to me. Some of you may be familiar. There's a notion of what's called spiritual ecology. And a lot of it stems from this notion, this uh, Norwegian, what's his name? Uh, um, Arne Nair, whatever it is, some of you. But it's deep ecology. He's the guy who started about writing about deep ecology. But it's, all, it's really coming out of the environmental movement. But the idea is that, you know, this oneness of this life is accessed through these different spiritual traditions, through the shamans, through the monks, through the gurus, you know, through the practitioners. And again, to come back to the question is, does, can a spiritual message resonate enough in the United States of America that we actually have a politics of loving our neighbor. <clears throat> the great, you know, what is the great commandment, Master? The great commandment, my friend, is love God and love your neighbor. Oh. Let's build a politics on loving your neighbor. How about loving your enemy? Now that's difficult. But your neighbor? But again, we have this culture, ostensibly Christian culture. And the question is, a politics of loving our neighbor? Which means that any child who's hungry, we attend to that kid. What do you mean he's hungry? This is not hungry. What do you mean that, that woman is sick and can't get access to health care? You know, that's not love of money. We go down the line of the pain and suffering in society. From a Buddhist point of view, 
the frame that always resonates with me is that there is no separate separation between myself and others. And therefore, it's when others suffer, I suffer. If I see us literally, and again, this isn't, you know, it's not obvious. It's easy to intellectually say, oh yeah, we're all one, that's cool. But to actually live that life is a different thing. So, this gets to what is the heart of the question. And it doesn't have to be Buddhism, that's for sure. We don't live in a Buddhist country. This is not Thailand, Burma, you know, Bhutan. Gross national happiness in Bhutan. It sounds lovely. I mean, wow, are you kidding me? The king comes forward, we're not going to do traditional economic, you know, the more you, any money, the gross national product, the sum total of goods and services in a given year. So if you uh, give birth to a child and they have to pay or you die, it all goes to the GMP, right? So that's all good, it's all good. That's different than measurements of happiness. So the question is, in terms of getting back to Buddhism, what does Buddhism have to offer 2,500 years after the Buddha passed? We think it's roughly there. And I know I've said this each time I'm gonna say it, every time I give a, give a talk, is that, first of all, I approach everything I say with the utmost humility. You know, this is just my sense of thing. I don't, I'm not arguing for one thing or another, really. This is sort of my understanding, as, min, as limited as that may be. Number two is the fact that the records of the Buddha and his lifetime are so thin that you have scholars, and I know I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again because it's too important, scholars who are incredibly talented, linguistically, Pali, Sanskrit, you know, some of them it's, you know, Burmese or Tibetan, or Thai or Chinese, and they got four or five languages, and they totally disagree on the fundamental question of when did the Buddha live. When I started looking at this 40 years ago, it was 563 to 483. That's just a fact. Everyone, 563 to 483. 20 years ago, the major scholars said, nope, we're off by about 80 years. So it's like 480 to 400. We don't even know when the Buddha lived, let alone what he actually said. Nothing was written down for 300 years. 300 years. Think about how it met and it's passed on orally. Think about how that can change over time. The memorization method at that time, especially among the Brahmins, the priests, was phenomenal, something that we can't even begin to imagine. What they were able to memorize, I think, is beyond our imagination because that's what they did from young children, the young boys who studied with their fathers who were priests, they learned how to memorize the Vedas, right? These, uh, the chants of the, 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 the dead. Forward, backwards, two words, two words. I mean, this memorization techniques are phenomenal. So maybe most of it's true. We don't know. So literally everything I say about what happened back then is just a, from my understanding of reading from people who really know a thousand times more than I do. So if you disagree with anything, that's fine. So with that caveat, my lawyers will defend me. What can I say? <laughs> the first lecture, very simply, was about the social conditions in which the Buddha lived. Because one of the questions I have is, what was an original, original teaching of the Buddha, and what was part of the culture at that time? It's pretty understood, karma. They were the Buddhists call, say rebirth, others say reincarnation, uh, Atman, the soul, and Brahman, the sort of ground of being in the universe. That was understood by most people in India as existing when the Buddha was born. He didn't create this idea of karma and rebirth and stuff. So, you know, what I'm interested in, one of the things I'm interested in is what is original and what was sort of there to begin with. He lived at a time of huge social change in eastern India. He grew up in Kapilavastu, which is up in the sort of foothills of the Himalayas, 
But the real uh, happening was taking place a bit to the south, a couple hundred miles in what was called Magada. Kosala was the state to, his, to the west. And uh, they had an iron was put into use. They cleared the field, the, the unbelievably thick forest. They grew much more food. Trade expanded mag just phenomenally. And therefore, a merchant class grew out of that, some of whom were super, super rich. The Buddhist followers came from the upper classes. There were four classes at the time. There was the Brahmins, the priests, there was the Buddhist class, they were the sort of warrior soldiers and the sort of political people. And then there were the uh, farmers and the traders, and then there were the servants. And the servants served the other three. That was literally their, their role in life. The top three were able to study with the Brahmins. The bottom uh, caste was not, what they called Varnas. The bottom class, and then you had some of the untouchables, and the people who lived in the forest, they were like <coughs> aliens, literally. They were known as the forest people. Anyways, and so um, what happened is that this, this third class of merchants became incredibly wealthy. A lot would happen in, fe in feudal Europe when the, when the merchants became wealthy, and the nobles and the church and the middle class has helped led to democracy and capitalism and all this other stuff. Anyways, so the Buddha's there. Money is used for the first time, really, in Indian history. It's very materialistic. And one of the interesting things is that a lot of his followers, and we have the, you know, scholars have sort of looked at the people in his group, his sangha, and they have the ca caste, the class that they were in, and most of them were either in the highest or the second. They were the elites of society. Uh, the Buddha came from the second class. He, you know, anyways. So it was this incredibly dynamic place. The other thing about that time in history that's so interesting, they had the so-called Shramana movement. That was the wandering ascetics, the wandering teachers. And there were dozens and dozens of them. The Buddha was just one of them. He was one of the superstars. There was also the Jains, J, well, in English, J-A-I-N-S, Mahavira was actually more of a heavyweight than the Buddha, because the Buddha spent six years in training out there in the wilderness. Mahavira spent 12 years, and he was very, very popular. And then there was another, the, the Ajivikas, and they had a little bit different philosophy, and this guy Gosala, who was a student of Mahavira, and he was sort of a wild guy. Anyways, but the Buddha, and the interesting thing is that, so the Buddha's one of, you know, and, and the Buddha was selling his philosophy, his dharma, all the time. And that's why his monks, they had particular colors. They behaved in a particular way. You know, the monks had 227 rules. The, the, the nuns had 311. You know, he allowed after three times his assistant, the nun says, master, 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 let the women in, let the women in. And the third time he finally says, okay. Anyways, <coughs> but they had many more rules, rules than the men. And most of them were about sex. I mean, it's not even like a close call, you know. A monk and a nun, like in this room all by themselves, that's a problem, seriously. Anyways, the Buddha had to have strict rules to keep his Sangha together, and this was the thing that was very interesting for me. He believed, number one, that his message was worth it for people, that he, that he would free them from rebirth, right? The reincarnation, this is called samsara. He thought that that was a noble thing, compassionate thing. I'm going to teach people so that they're not reborn. In order for his message to maintain and survive, he needed this, his group, his followers, called the Sangha, right? Which could do, you could have a political Sangha, you could have a social Sangha. He had a religious Sangha. So his Sangha, the Buddha Sangha, if you will, um, he had to make sure that they stayed together. Because if they didn't stay, and they were the ones who basically maintained his teaching, his dharma. And if they fell apart, his teachings would be lost forever. So that's why he was very, very strict about having a very harmonious sangha, a harmonious community. And he believed that, I mean, this is a quote, I mean, he, he was not free of the, you know, patriarchal, misogynistic sort of values of much of India at that time is that um, he says when, when he accepted women as nuns, you know, and the first one was his, the woman who literally raised him. It was his, his mother died supposedly after seven days. 
his mother's sister raised the Buddha, young Siddhartha Gautama, Gautama, whatever, young Siddhartha. She was the one who came and two times he said no. The third time because of his assistant Ananda. He says yes, but he said the Dharma will lose 500 years because we've allowed women into, the, in, into our Sangha. Yeah. But the point is, is that he, he, the Sangha was the way that his teaching would go on in perpetuity. So that's basically what the first talk was about. And it is interesting, I think, that 2,500 years, years later, the Buddhist Sangha still exists. So this is the oldest surviving organization in the world, 2,500 <coughs> years later. The second talk was very much about him as a leader. In his Sangha group, it was fairly democratic. He didn't quite see himself as a leader, although he was a leader. He was what was called in, in the literature a charismatic leader. He had achieved greatness through his great enlightenment. He, his integrity was clearly intact due to living a noble life. And his teaching was formidable. And he you know, had a very powerful, without any question, very, very powerful personality. And yet he was fairly open. He changed the rules all the time. You know, in terms of whether, how, how much food you could have in the monastery. I mean, they, in the beginning there were no monasteries. Every, the, 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 uh, the monks had to be on the road 12 months a year, in the very beginning. But the problem was, there's a four month uh, monsoon season from June into October. June, July, you know, July, August, September, October. July through October, it rains. It's been to India, our Indian friends here. The monsoons, the rivers go from here to like oceans, literally, you know. Especially in that part of India, the, the Ganges River Basin from the Himalayas, it's just unbelievable. Anyways, the point is, is that his monks in the very beginning walked 12 months a year because he went after a month or a couple of months, he said his first 60 disciples, he says, go and teach the Dharma. Go in 60 different directions. For the good of the world, for the support of the world, out of compassion for the world, you will teach the Dharma. His first 60 disciples, they were all supposedly enlightened. Buddhism is a missionary religion. My teacher, who was American, my first teacher, his teacher was Japanese. And of course, there were a lot of Japanese, Italian, Tibetans, and so forth. They, and my teacher's teacher, he was told by his teacher, this Japanese young monk, 25 years old, didn't speak hardly any English. And his, his teacher, you're going to go to uh, America, and you're going to go teach the Dharma. He's going, really? Okay. And there he shows up in Los Angeles and starts the Zen community of, of Los Angeles, CCLA. Anyways. In the beginning, the, the disciples were going everywhere, but they were, they were walking on in the fields, and they were killing plants. And people started to complain to the Buddha, dude, your, your, your monks are killing our crops because they're walking during the monsoon season. And so like the other wandering aesthetics, the Buddha changed the rule. And then he had rules about whether or not you could wear sandals. And first it was one strap, and then it was two straps, and then three straps. And then food, you couldn't have any food, and then you could store food, but you couldn't cook it. And then you could cook it, and then you could store it and cook it. The Buddha was very, very pragmatic in terms of his sangha. And <coughs> one of the problems, interesting historical, again, this is the story. Right before he died, his assistant Ananda, who was a relative, cousin, nephew. And um, Ananda says, Master, you're gonna die in a couple days, and um, who's gonna succeed you as the leader? He says, no, no success to the Dharma. My teaching is going to be my successor. And he goes, well, what part of your teaching? And the Buddha says, this is the story, right? The Buddha says, oh, only the most important, the most important teachings. But don't worry about the less important ones. The Buddha dies, the monks get together, they're trying to figure out, you know, they have this giant sort of, let's call first council, 500 monks get together, and they said to Ananda, like day one, so what did the Buddha say was, the, what, 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 the, what the teaching was? He said, well, we should, just, we, we should just worry about the most important teachings, 
But we don't have to worry about the less important teachings, and we can change those anytime we want to. We just have to make sure that uh, we don't change any of the more important ones. And then they ask well another, which one are the important ones? He goes, oh, geez, I didn't ask that question. So anyways, they kept them all, which is why they were like three, you know, 200 and more, 27, which is crazy. If you read them, they're, it's, it's, some of them seem a little frivolous. Yeah. That's just my opinion. Politically, the Buddha was very astute. He was like a player in Eastern Europe, Eastern, Eastern India, uh, especially in this, the state of Magadha, which is uh, where Bulgaria uh, is actually. Anyways, but that was the center of, um, of power and economics in, in, in India at the time. And there were two great kings. And the thing is, is that he had followers by the thousands. And the, this was a time when king could kill people just by, you know, dozens of people without batting an eyelash. The level of violence at that time was very formidable. If you ever want to read a really incredible book, Upinda uh, Singh was an uh, Indian scholar at University of Delhi, uh, obviously in India, written a number of books. She's a great, great scholar, in my opinion. But she wrote this book, Violence in Ancient India. And it is an incredible sociological study of what life was like that in really remarkable detail. Uh, anyways, but kings could do whatever they wanted, very simply. They would, had absolute power, they had armies, they had all the weapons. <coughs> anyways, he had to be very careful that the kings allowed his thousands of followers to go freely. And he became very, very close to the two most powerful men in India, the two kings of Magadha and of Kosala. And he developed relationships over 30, 40 years with them, and they were both actually murdered by their sons. And then he became close to the sons because the son became the king. And that's just what you had to do. So, and you know, it was everything from the point of view that the king came to him and says, oh, by the way, I am going to invade these people. I'm going to, we're going to have a war. And um, I just want you to know that. And the Buddha did not say, no, you shouldn't do that. The Buddha made a very indirect presentation about why that may not be the best timing. But he never ever, from what we understand, or scholars understand, he never really challenged that. So, what we have is that the Buddha dies roughly 400 uh, BCE, before the Common Era. And it took quite a while for Buddhism to spread throughout Southeast Asia. It goes, you know, it's, you know the Himalayas are to the north, the ocean to the, to the east. Um, if you look at the map, this really poor map, I apologize to my enemies. What this shows is where, one of the things you can read on the map, the, the map's over there if you guys want to get some. But what the map shows is that you can read the numbers of the dates. And this is when Buddhism arrived in these different places. So up in, you know, around, let's just take it, uh, you know, Central Asia, the fourth or fifth, the common era. You know, if you go into China, or you go over right over to Japan, you know, you have, you know, the fifth to the seventh cent uh, century. Northern Japan, the 9th century, the 5th to the 9th century. Uh, you know, Buddhism went from Korea down to Japan. Anyways, the Philippines in the 10th century, down to uh, Indonesia, you know, Borobudur, the great uh, Buddhist temple that I visited many years ago down there, an incredible place. Uh, what is it, the 7th to the 12th century. Anyways, but the point is, is that Buddhism spread. Again, Buddhism was, and to a certain extent today, uh, I guess you'd call it a missionary religion, and it spread throughout this area. They, the politics of the, you know, this is about Buddhism and politics, and make a very long story short, is that in different countries at different times, Buddhist communities developed. Hinduism became, vis became prominent in certain places, Islam spread in certain places. If you go to a place like Indonesia, you find Borobudur, this made the biggest, I think it's the biggest temple in the world on Java, I think it is, southern Java. And then it's, but Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world today. And the Hindus were there for a while as well. But you get very, very Buddhist countries, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Burma, 
China, historically Japan, Korea, um, you know, Tibet, clearly, Bhutan, etc. Um, Thailand. And so during those hundreds and hundreds of years, what we had was that the Buddhist community basically had to defer to what were mostly kings at that time, to the monarchies. And it was somewhat like Europe, that you had the political power and the Catholic Church, they went hand in hand. They gave legitimacy to one another. You'd often have the government, the state, providing resources for the Buddhist community. Sometimes you had clashes from the Buddhists when some of the, uh, the polit political leaders came down very, very hard on the uh, Buddhist communities, when the Buddhist communities seemed to be somewhat independent politically, and you'd have to go country by country. It was very long, very vast uh, history. So, what I'd like to do is I'm going to jump about 2,000 years to the modern era, okay, what we call the modern era. And uh, I'm going to jump to, and again, the, the topic here is engaged Buddhism today. The definition of engaged Buddhism is relatively straightforward. It's a phenomenon that we find all over the world where there are Buddhists. And it's a very, very powerful in much of Asia. It's very powerful in parts of the United States and Europe and elsewhere. And basically, engaged Buddhism are Buddhists who take on political activism in a using the Buddhist teaching as their guide. Loving kindness, non-separation, non-violence, etc. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and so what I wanted to do is look at some of these figures, and, and these are these are folks who have very long histories. There are books on all of them. I the name, it's the, the other handout that I um, that I have, if you don't have it, this is one here, it's the list of the Buddhist teachers. And so what I want to do is just make reference to this, because I'm sure these, some of these names are not familiar to you. They were surely not familiar to me not that long ago. And I want to start out by recognizing that, okay, I want to make sure you keep watching. Max Weber wrote a very important piece in the early 1900s and said that Buddhism was otherworldly. And so for the next 50, 60 years, scholars who studied Weber, the great sociologist, and studied Buddhism read this guy and they said, oh, the Buddhists aren't very political. They're really passive. And to a certain extent, there was truth to that in the sense that Buddhists were not marching in the streets at that time. <coughs> However, there was always this relationship between the government, the state, the kings, and the Buddhist communities. So in many ways, they were always political. They weren't political in the sense of being activists necessarily, but we'd have to take it country by country, but there were times when in fact Buddhists came forward for one reason or another. So with that in mind, Buddhism has what's called the three wheels. There's Theravada Buddhism, the sort of tradition of the elders, Mahayana, which is, you know. So the Theravada countries are like there's Burma and Thailand and, and parts of Cambodia and Sri Lanka. Um, you know, Mahayana, the sort of northern school, China, Japan, Korea, parts of Vietnam, uh, Tibet. So there's like these two sort of, they divide them up into different traditions and we could spend a lot of time talking about them. And then there's the Vajrayana, which is sort of the Tibetan um, tradition and Tantra plays an important part there and the other traditional traditions in Tibet itself. And um, some of you may be familiar with this guy, Ambedkar. He was a great, great, great uh, Indian who was a Dalit. He was from, he was an untouchable, uh, he was around at the time of Gandhi, and he's a guy I'd never heard of before, I don't know how many years ago, but not that long ago. He was supposedly more popular than Gandhi, Ambedkar is his name. 
and he he was uh, he was a Dalit. He was an untouchable, very smart guy. Got a, a scholarship. Went to the United States, got a PhD. Went to England, got another PhD. He had either one or, or had a law degree. I can't remember. He came back to India at the time of independence. Nehru, Gandhi, and Ambedkar was the guy who basically was the lead writer of the Indian Constitution. He was a Buddhist. He grew up uh, Hindu, like everybody in his class. Studied Christianity. Decided to, to become a Buddhist. And he's one of the great, great figures in history, period. Um, and he's really to defend the interests of uh, the untouchables in India. And uh, a remarkable, remarkable story. Anyways, uh, Ambedkar was uh, the one who, who was an activist at that time in defense of the poorest of the poor people in India. And he coined a phrase called the new, um, the new, basically the new wheel. It was, and it was, he was the one who, who basically began this idea of engaged Buddhism, that we're going to be political. And he was very, very political before he died tragically as a relatively young man. Now the, the term engaged Buddhism, if you read books on this, they usually attribute it to Thich Nhat Hanh, the famous Vietnamese monk and scholar and activist in some of his writing in the early 60s. Um, and probably the term uh, engaged Buddhism. And Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, I'm sure many of you know his work or familiar with him at some level. You know, his famous comment is, if, you're, if Buddhism is not engaged, it's not Buddhism. And Thich Nhat Hanh, it was just one of these, you know, remarkable historic figures. Um, was unbelievably political in what he did. And during the Vietnam War, the Kurds working with both people and literally training young Vietnamese, you know, college students and young teenagers to go into the fields while the Americans were bombing, the communists on one side, the Viet Cong on one side, the Americans on the other. And, and Thich Nhat Hanh literally, literally stood in the middle of the fields as the bombs were dropping attending to people who were injured and training young Vietnamese to do that. He was out there with the uh, Vietnamese boat people that some of us who are, you know, from the last century, we remember this stuff. Anyways, engaged Buddhism was seen as a development in the 2,500 year old history of Buddhism that began, I'll talk very quickly about this really interesting guy, um, Dharmapala. I'll talk about him in a second. But basically, it's a phenomenon of the last 50 years or so that came out of Asia, came out of so-called West, and it became, it was Buddhist leaders who engaged politically on everything from democracy, on women's rights, on poverty issues, and especially on global warming. Um, so what I've done here is I've laid out a variety of folks here, and I didn't put down the books. They all have so many books. Just Google them or whatever, wherever you go for some, uh, you know, Amazon, wherever, just to get a list of the books. There are books about all of these folks. And, um, and there are others who I have not included here because there is just, there's a lot of folks. But let me just go through uh, this piece by piece here and sort of talk about some of the things that stand out. So Ashoka came, was around, you know, 100, 200, 150 years after the Buddha. The Buddha was alive at the time when monarchies became very powerful. Prior to that time, there were like these local, um, they, they called them democracies, they were kind of republics, but they were sort of elitist, they were the heads of clans would get together and make decisions. And so it was democratic in the sense that, you know, different clans, different families are, 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 are represented, usually the oldest man. They had formal meetings, they had, they had voting, they had process about how to make proposals, how to approve things, etc. So you had this tradition actually from where the Buddha grew up, grew up. and just for the record, you know, the Buddha's father was called Raja, R-A-J-A, -A, and you read, I don't know, six out of ten things that come out today, they talk about him as a king. He was not a king, from all the evidence, the people, political science who read this. 
the, he was basically voted, he's like the mayor of uh, Kapi Labasa, where he lived. The clans got, the, the heads of the clans got together, and they had rules, and they voted the leader. And that person was a leader for a certain amount of time, and then they would, and, they, and his father was a very respected guy, and obviously came from a certain amount of money, and he was voted time and again to be the, the mayor or the governor. The Buddha was the son of that person. And just because your father's the governor doesn't mean that you're the governor. He wasn't, I mean, a prince, you know, the people who really look at this closer over the last 40, 50 years say, no, it's just not, that's just not what it was. But the word Raja is the same. It could be king, it could be, but it's basically the leader, if you will. The chief, it could be chief. You know, that may not be, uh, you know, the chief is chosen often because of character, you know, in tribal and clan-based uh, places. Anyways, at the time of the Buddha, so Ashoka shows up 150 years later. He's part of the Mauryan dynasty there. The whole interesting story behind that. He comes to power. His grandfather becomes the first king. His father becomes the second. Ashoka, by the time he becomes king, India is unified almost completely for the first time in all of history, except for the southern part and the southern state of Kalinga, which is in southeastern India. When you become the king in India at that time, your job was to expand the territory. That's just sort of, it was expected. That's, that's how it, people rolled. That's why you became the king, to bring more wealth and power to your people, right? He comes into power, he invades Kalinga. The story goes is that he, his army defeated them without any trouble because he was Magadha, the most powerful state in all of India and that he killed, he killed a hundred, his soldiers, army killed a hundred thousand people, and they took a hundred thousand other people as prisoners. So, and the story goes is that he witnesses this and he has a revelation. This is Saul on the road to Damascus, being struck by lightning and having a revelation that he's now a peacemaker. Ashoka decides that he's had enough violence, he is going to embrace a pacifist perspective. You have to have an army. Nobody questions. The Buddha always supported kings. The Buddha never questioned that a king shouldn't have an army. You, he would say in the past, you need to support the army, you need to support the priests, you need to support you know, the, uh, the farmers, you need to support the traders. This is the Buddha talking now. Always saying you need to support the army. Ashoka has this revelation, decides that he is going to basically follow the Buddhist teachings of nonviolence as his guide. He calls it his dharma. He does not, this is important, some people say he's the Buddhist emperor, the Buddhist king, and to a certain extent he is. Ashoka borrowed, let's just call it 80-90% of the Buddhist teachings, and then he added about 10 or 20% of his own so that it was his story. You know, he's a politician. He's, he's governing all of India. The very southern tip he doesn't control, but it's very weak and would never challenge uh, Ashoka at that point. So he governs all of India. This is, a, this is unbelievable. We're talking 2,250 before the Common Era. India is an enormous country. And so he has to have this bureaucracy throughout this whole place. So he comes with this political strategy. This is so, so strategic. How do you unify a part of the world with, you know, literally a hundred languages, all these different religions? I mean, it's becoming more and more what we would call Hindu, Brahmin at the time. But there are all sorts of, you know, these guys walking around professing to have the, re the truth. So there's all these religions, all these languages, Ethnically, you have all these clans, you have all this tribal, I mean, <coughs> this is a very rough place. It's, you know, people are living to 20, 25 years old. It's, life is very, very hard. How do you keep all these people together? And he says, the Dharma. My Dharma is going to unify these folks. And then it's all of these. This is what he decides. We will respect, and this is the thing, this is the most amazing thing about him. He had pillars built. This is 2,500. As far as we know, and again, there's some debate. This is the oldest proven written language 
in India are his pillars. There's 33 of them. And they were inscriptions. Some of them were in caves. Some of them were on rock faces. But um, what do you call that? Uh, obelisk? No. What's it called? It's like the Bennington Monument or the Jeff, what do you call it? What's the uh, link? What's the thing? Obelisk. Yeah, obelisk. It's an obelisk. Obelisk. Yeah. obelisk. What's, what's the thing in Washington that goes yeah. way up like that? <laughs> right. What's it, but what's the monument? Washington Monument. That one. The yeah. Washington Monument. It's shaped like that. Yeah. He built all of these mm -hmm. that are standing today. You know, 2,250 years old. He, what we know about this guy is what he had written on these monuments in different languages. And that's the oldest proven written documentation that we have of language. There's an argument about how much came before that. It may have been quite a bit. We don't, we just don't know. He told the history of the battle of 100,000 and 100,000, and he had this revolution, and then he spelled out his dharma. That's why we know it today. And the interesting thing, another, another interesting thing, after tw the 12th century, Buddhism disappeared from India altogether, altogether. Many, uh, there were, uh, for hundreds of years, Muslim, uh, Muslim armies controlled northern India. Nalanda, the great, maybe one of the greatest, oldest uh, university, which has been rebuilt, was all the books were burnt at the time. We're talking like 8th century, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and then after that. So we're talking much later. But the point is that, that um, we know this because it's written. And for hundreds of years, these things were lost to history. But only the British imperialist, when they occupied India, this is true, this is like scary true story, what we know about Ashoka is completely because one of these bureaucrats was really, you know, wanted to get into local culture, discovered these monuments. And then some British scholar who was another, you know, state employee for the bureaucrats of the imperial, you know, colonial office, learned the language and translated it. And then another one of his colleagues figured out it was Ashoka they were talking about. So it went for hundreds and hundreds of years, this was absolutely gone from history. And so here we are 150 years later, we now know this stuff about Ashoka. He called on uh, people throughout the empire and his agents throughout the empire to respect all religions, all the non-Buddhist religions. Number two, to dig wells. This is like socialism. This is like state-sponsored social services and a, um, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it when you provide social services from the bottom up? Um, what's that? Safety net, thank you. There is a safety net, if you will, for, so there, Dell's, uh, wells were to be built every few miles for travelers. There were to be places where travelers could rest. There was to be medicine at these places where people met, met. there were, uh, the government was supposed to spe pay special attention to poor people. They were to pay special attention to the aged. When Ashoka and the others would have dinner, they would kill many, many dozens of animals, from pigs to chickens to the birds to the cows, you name it. I mean, I don't know, I'm not sure when the cow, you know, were in that transition. I mean, one of the great sacrifices that the Brahmins carried out were the so-called horse sacrifices. The cows, I'm going to back retract what I said about cows. Forget about that. Because that was, uh, anyways, I'm not so sure about that. But, but horses were actually part of these year-long ceremonies. When you became king, you had Brahmins come in, pay them a lot of money, and they would have these sacrifices of, kill, of burning horse, horses, anyways. But the point is, is that they would kill dozens and dozens of animals so the, for the feast of the king, because there was lots of other people there. You know, if you're the king, you're the king, right? So he says, we're going to minimize, we're going to minimize the number of animals that are killed to just a few. So basically he says, we're not going to have any more war. We're going to support poor people. We're going to support older folks. We're going to support travelers. We're going to support sick people. 
We're going to not kill animals, more than just a few. We're going to support all the religions, all of them. We're going to be respectful. And we're going to create a new society based on the Dharma. And it's a, it is a moral philosophy that we take care of each other. So he's in power for about 30 years or so, unifies India. And the other thing that he does, the story goes, he sends his daughter to Sri Lanka. And possibly his son, but that's less evident. That's less proven, if you will, supported. Sri Lanka becomes the center of Buddhism in the world. Because again, by the 12th century, India is devoid of Buddhism. It has, Hinduism has totally taken over the damage. Uh, anyways, the Buddhists, the Buddhists are, they're almost, can't be found. Sri Lanka becomes the center of Buddhist activity. Sri Lanka is the place, the great monastery in Sri Lanka is where the Pali Canon is written down. 300 years after the Buddha, in the language of Pali, not different, too different from Sanskrit, is written down in its most comprehensive fashion. That's what we have today, our, our extant, right? Our, our, what, is, what we have in the world today is from Sri Lanka from that time, from this great monastery. And it was because, and again, they see themselves, the Sri Lankans say that Ashoka sent his daughter, possibly his son, to us to hold the Dharma. And so they have a very, very strong claim. And that's very much, and again, when we get to the Sri Lankan Civil War, the Buddhism as identity for those who are defending, you know, the, the, uh, the war um, against the Tamil Tigers, the argument is, is that, you know, in the same thing that's going on in Burma today, right? We, this is a Buddhist country. Therefore, we have, to, we have to protect ourselves from the foreigners who are trying to invade us. Not only are they trying to ruin our religion, they're trying to ruin our very way of life, right? This is the argument. And it goes from the fact that Ashoka's daughter goes there and supposedly, supposedly, she got one of the offshoots of the, the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya. Supposedly it's the third, uh, it's now the third tree. It's got to be, if you ever go to it, it's this remarkable place. Anyways, but supposedly she brought a, what do you call the off, a shoot, right? A shoot of the tree and then planted it in Sri Lanka. Whether or not that's true, we don't. Anyways, so that's a show. Let's just jump uh, to this. Uh, and do, we have, a, if you want to look at this, we have the page, uh, paper over here. Buddhist political activists. The winners of the Nobel Peace Prize in recent decades, the Dalai Lama, 1989, Aung San Suu Kyi, 1991. Interesting story in there with what's going on and her role in it, uh, but we'll put that aside for sure for the moment. But two folks, and then the nominee, Thich Nhat Hanh. Again, this is a lovely story if you ever read it. You know, Martin Luther King and Thich Nhat Hanh got together and they were like brothers in their literally giving their lives and risking their lives. I mean, the number of times Thich Nhat Hanh has risked his life, I think you couldn't possibly count. And Martin Luther King, the exact same thing. And uh, Martin Luther King nominated Thich Nhat Hanh for the Nobel Peace Prize. A.T. Aratne, Sri Lanka, just a remarkable, I'll talk about him in a second. He nominated 2005. And then this guy out of <laughs> Mahagosadananda of Cambodia. He's nominated four times. This is a guy, the, the, what I understand, what I remember, is basically his entire family was murdered by the Khmer Rouge. If it wasn't his entire family, it was a good part of his family. Absolutely murdered by the, uh, by the Khmer Rouge. He was a champion of peace walks across Cambodia once the Khmer Rouge had been replaced. And, um, and uh, supposedly he was this magnetic, charismatic person of just absolute sort of, sort of like a Dalai, Dalai Lama type of almost innocence and joyfulness that defied the suffering that he must have gone, being Cambodian, having that happen to his parents, 
literally sort of being on the other side of enlightenment, and just beyond sort of <coughs> imagination. Anyways, four different times to imagine. Let's just go down the list. Dharmapala. One of the interesting things that happens in Asia in the, in, the 19, in the 1800s is, of course, you have European imperialism that takes over all of, almost all of Asia. <coughs> Thailand's not occupied, the Dutch in Indonesia, the French in Indochina, you know, the multiple, multiple countries in China from the very early on, you know, you had the the Kuomintang and Mao fighting it out in the late 20s and the early 30s and all of that. But you had, you know, China was occupied after the, um, after the Opium Wars in the 1850s. There's a whole series of wars that the Europeans and the Americans, not so much, but the Europeans, they controlled China, especially the trade. And, you know, they, it was so bad that they forced, you know, the Chinese, some of the young Chinese in the early 1900s, these young men wanted to get rid of opium. And the British stopped the effort to get rid of opium because the British were making so much money. And opium was killing, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people or people. And these, these, these reformers were trying to get rid of opium and the British in their greed, etc., uh, basically suppressed this movement to get rid of opium. But I mean, that's just the beginning. The, the, Indo, the French in Indochina, uh, you had the Dutch, what they did in Indonesia, the story goes on and on. Uh, the British in India, etc. So what's interesting is that in the Buddhist countries, Buddhism becomes a rallying point for the nationalist, right? And this is, uh, so Dharmapala is from one of the wealthiest families in Sri Lanka. Very Buddhist family, very wealthy. He's educated in English in the best of the, in the British schools, right? He travels, he eventually travels all over the world he becomes a champion of Sri Lankan and Indian nationalism, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, for full-fledged independence for Sri Lanka and for India. This guy is a warrior for independence at this time. Interesting, 1993, there's the World Conference of Religions, I think it's called, in Chicago. It's one of the great, I mean, scholars write about it all the time because it had some of the great figures at that time who came together. He goes there as a Sri Lankan man. I think, he, he, I, you know, he, he surely knew how to, I mean, he, you know, he's a rich guy. He's traveled all over the world. He knew how to wear a coat and tie. I think he came dressed in very traditional attire to Chicago, standing out, and he gives an impassioned speech in, uh, you know, in favor of Buddhism, against imperialism, against uh, British colonialism. And one of the things that he does that moves the entire, I should say, much of the Buddhist world into what's called modern, Buddhist modernism. Modernism, I mean, you know, we know it, but it's almost, we know it too well. The modern era. We take it for granted. But this is not the way of the world. Women's rights, civil rights, equal rights, democracy, freedom of religion, freedom of association. These are the values that came with the Renaissance, what we call the modern era. You know, it, it's feudalism, you're born a serf, you die a serf. You're born a noble, you die a noble. What capital L, liberalism, 14, 15, 16, 1700s, the idea of individual freedom. Politically, that means democracy. You vote people. Regular people vote, vote in theory. Socially, you choose the religion you want. You marry someone from another religion. Or maybe you're an atheist and they won't kill you for it. This is like serious business, right? Capitalism, individual freedom to own property. It's not the king that owns everything now or the Lord. Guess what? What used to be a serf, it's now your farm. You can invest. You can also become wealthy. 
Now again, the critique of those institutions today is a full one. At that time, this is about human freedom of the first order. The Buddhist countries in Asia look to Buddhism as a way for national identity. And a lot of the leaders were also educated in Europe. And they brought a lot of the liberal values of civil rights, democratic rights, a free press. This was revolutionary in 1850 in most of the world. I mean, you had the counter, you had the revolutions of Europe 1848, and then you had the counter revolutions, which was terrifying. So the world is still, this is the old world. And so you have this movement in Asia of embracing the idea of democracy. And of course, what that meant was independence from colonial rule. And Buddhism is also part of that national identity. So you have this incredibly interesting merging of a lot of the values of the West with, the, with a Buddhist practice from Asia coming together, both in Asia as well as in the West. And so what we see in Dharmapala, this guy of Sri Lankan, he's one of the forerunners of this entire movement. And so um, what we have is very slowly over time, this continues to spread. So let me just make my way down. I'm going to stop in a couple of minutes and make one final uh, set of points. The Dalai Lama, one of the things that stands out for me in terms of his teaching, number one, he calls himself half of a Marxist. Almost all of these folks are socialist. They are very critical of fundamentalist market philosophy that you would find in this country and elsewhere. Basically, it's about greed. Um, the Buddha had four requisites. When you join when you join the, the, the Sangha, you got food, you got clothing, you got medicine, and you got shelter. What we call in development studies, the basic needs, right? Basic needs approach, from a moral point of view, I actually believe in this. I think people should have health care and food and shelter, and the state should do what, you know, whatever private uh, sector cannot. The Dalai Lama calls himself, I'm half of a Marxist. And he's not a communist. He's not talking about Leninist, you know, Chinese Communist Party led Leninist, Stalinist type of policies. He's talking much more about a social democracy. Um, anyways. So the Dalai Lama, but one of the things politically, he talks about universal responsibility. The Dalai Lama says we are at the point, a couple things. We gotta let go of religion. Religion is not the answer. You know, here's the head of Tibetan Buddhism, right? Religion is not the answer. Spirituality is the answer. Spirituality recognizing the oneness of this world and of one another. So number one, he argues for a spiritual approach, a non-religious approach. He says universal responsibility is for everyone. He calls for a universal ethic. Thich Nhat Hanh, of course, his teachings around mindfulness and the idea that, and the Dalai, all of these say, all of these folks say what I'm about to say. One of the things that's got to happen is that we all need to develop our internal lives much more fully. That we have brilliant exterior lives, materialism, technology. But in many ways, so we're very mature there, but we're very immature in terms of our emotional life. Anger, frustration, resentment, hatred, all of that. We simply have a long way to go in order to master that. There's the famous quotes of the generals, you know, I can conquer five armies, but to conquer my own mind, that's the most difficult at all. And again, I think all of these teachers would argue that a mindfulness practice, a meditation practice, a prayer practice, and I would suggest that any practice where people are still, people are living in the moment, people are really being present for just, just this, just this, that that would bring a, a level of stability, sanity, equanimity. And you know, his mindfulness stuff, writing and teaching is just incredible. Srila Srivaraksa is this fabulous Thai 
writer. He established the International Network of Engaged Buddhists. He's been kicked out of Thailand X number of times because the military runs, has run Thailand. You know, they have a monarchy. It's quasi-democratic. Uh, and he's been thrown out numerous times. He's very, very critical of the Buddhist, of the Buddhists, a lot of the Buddhists who he thinks are much too much in bed with the military. And he's very, very, very criti critical of the, uh, of the military. He thinks that globalization has ruined Thailand, that he very much believes is to keep you know, corporations out, keep business small, keep, people, keep things local. He's a very, very powerful writer. Joanna Macy, uh, I think is just, I mean, I've seen her, I've seen her speak a number of times. She's, a, I think, one of the great Americans today. Um, she's an environmentalist. And if you haven't read her book, as far as I'm concerned, she is surely among the top five Buddhist political writers in the English language, for my money, anywhere in the world today. Um, she, so, I, 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 don't want, I, I want to stop here in a minute. Um, she argues, in a nutshell, that we can be cynical about where we are, we can deny where we are with global warming and all of this. Uh, we can turn our heads. We can bury our heads in the sand. Or she talks about the great turning. She says there is a movement globally that is making a difference in terms of sustainability, in terms of sanity, in terms of the environment, in terms of global warming, in terms of poverty in terms of women's issues, in terms of violence. And the argument there is that there are actually millions, millions of nonprofit organizations that we never hear about. Because all we hear about are the, you know, the loudest voices on social media when in fact there is an undercurrent of incredible compassionate work taking place in the world today. We're just not tapped into it. And her, if you go to, just go to her website, she's written a number of, I think, just the most powerful books about how to transform this country and the world. I think she's just absolutely brilliant. Bernie Glassman, head of Zen Peacemaker Order, he was my teacher for 20 years. I'm, you know, this is part of Zen Peacemaker Order. Uh, very dynamic guy, developed his Zen Peace, anyways, he, all sorts of, he's a social entrepreneur. And you know, just to make you happy when you go to the supermarket. Um, and I used to work there as part of our, when we had retreats and so forth. We would go to work at the Grayson Bakery, bakery as being a good Buddhist, we go work at the bakery. The Grayson Bakery makes the brownies for Ben and Jerry's uh, chocolate, uh, what's it called? Chocolate brownie, what's it called? No, no, it's the brownie. What's the chocolate brownie, the Ben and Jerry's chocolate brownie? You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Anyways, the brownie itself is made at the Grayston Bakery. And, you know, 15 years ago, I was cutting up brownies to go off to Ben and Jerry's. Anyways, so he, you know, he gave up, Bernie gave up all his robes. He gave up all this stuff. I mean, he would wear this, that's all. He would wear the rock suit, which is like a tiny robe. Uh, but he gave up all the other stuff. Bhikkhu Bodhi is, I think, one of the great, I mean, he's translated thousands of pages of the Pali, the original Buddhism. He's an activist. He's, a, I think, a, just a remarkable, remarkable, he's an American monk, remarkable guy. And these are just people I've just decided. Buddha Dasa is a guy, he's a Thai guy. He died probably 10, 15, when did he die? Uh, 30 years ago, whatever, 20, 30 years ago. His writing is incredible, and he writes about Dharma socialism, which I think is as powerful as anything. He makes the argument, and I'm not talking, you know, socialism is not communism. Communism is one party rule, they have a monopoly of power, and the party chooses everything. That's, you know, what that's called, uh, it's Leninism is what it is, and then you add Stalin to that, you have uh, brutality on top of it. Socialism is, you know, is the sweetest model of democratic socialism. You have a certain amount of capitalism, and then you have socialism that the state provides, fills in the gaps where capitalism does not. Uh, but, you know, for those who, who criticize Buddhists who talk about socialism, they're not talking about Leninist 
you know, Soviet or Chinese communists. They're not talking about that. They're talking about more Scandinavian, European style of democratic socialism. Anyways. The end of the day, I guess the question I have is, my hope in all this is sort of uncovering the spiritual component of Buddhism that is universal. You know, the mindfulness movement, which has its critics, and I'm well aware of them, and that's another topic, but mindfulness has become part of all sectors of society. And for me, I'd rather have, you know, a policeman, a soldier, a college student, a corporate person, a, a nurse, a doctor, a student, a mother, a father. I'd rather have all of them have a equanimity due to mindfulness practice, meditation practice, when they have to make the decisions that they have to do. I feel that mindfulness brings forth compassion uh, in an authentic way. Anyways, but that's, that's a place where Buddhism sort of spread out into a more universal uh, you know, character, if you will. So my question is, is, are there things of Buddhism that in fact can have a, a political impact in the United States of America and or elsewhere? And how does the sort of mystical, what I would call, let's call it the mystical, the spiritual side of Buddhism, how does that link up with all the other traditions and the mystic side of those traditions to create basically this sort of spiritual universality, this what's called, some call the interspiritual, interspirituality across religious traditions and really bring forth really compassion as the sort of guiding principle for all decisions. And for me, you know, at the end of this, what we're looking for literally is a politics of compassion where the alle alleviation of suffering is really at the forefront of what we're doing. So anyways, um, as usual, I've spoken much too long. We have a few minutes, so I'd love to hear comments, questions. Um, so thank you. You've been uh, incredibly patient and attentive uh, folks here, so I'm grateful. So I just want to say thank you to Tom. Oh, hi. <laughs> for you know, guiding us and reminding us about and how important it is, how every time you have an interaction with a person, you have a chance to do good work. And I'm so grateful for that. And, um, and I'm grateful for you bringing these to us. And I also just want to mention too, because I have to give a shout out to the library, we do have books by many of the authors that Tom um, mentioned tonight. So don't go to Amazon. Go to the library. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Let me just say that star is a star. <laughs> Thank you, Kendra. See you, buddy. Take it easy. Please, comments. Please, go ahead. Um, <laughs> maybe you could further flesh out my understanding, and this may be irrelevant. Can you or, speak up a little more? I got oh, bad ears. Uh, I'm sorry. Something I, a question I have. Yeah, I sure. know a little bit, yeah. and yet I have. Uh, I wish you could flesh out a little bit more. Sure. Um, of my understanding or misunderstanding of pariah. Of? Pariah. Pariah. Now, is that a Hindu concept? It, I gather in, um, in India, um, there, there used to be uh, castes. Right. And oh, are you talking about like pariah as in caste, like outcasts? Yes, but not not to be confused with untouchable. I see. They were people who were ca cast out I of see. their caste and all caste. They they no longer qualified as the the great order of, right. of things. I don't know. You know, you know, I'm um, one of the things that a lot of this work has done for me is I mean, I, I, you know, I was in India 100 years ago and traveled and so forth. And I've been reading some on <coughs> India today, but I'm really not in a position to say much other than, you know, 
the caste system at the time of the Buddha was very fluid, and it had not come into play. It was called what are called varnas, the four, you know, the, there's the priests, etc., and then the servants. And then there were what are called jatis, J-A-T-I. And they used those two words together. Jatis could be because of uh, occupation. One of the things that happened at the time of the Buddha is that with this, it wasn't industrialization, but it was almost like that. You had all these crafts that developed, and so people lived in villages where all they did was do like pottery, or all that they, they did was do uh, metalwork, and those became a jati. They became one of these sub-castes. And so the caste system solidified over hundreds of years, much after the time of the Buddha, so that as I understand it, I mean, there may be considered thousands of them, but I just, I, I hesitate to say anything more than that I really, I, I, I don't know about to, you know, beyond that. And I don't know about this notion of pariah as in beyond the untouchables, if you will. Okay, my little bit of Please. thumbnail uh, research. Yeah. Um, one other, uh, pariah, one other th word they said were, they were drummers. Uh -huh. And that also, I gather in Indian, traditional Indian music were the, sitar and, and the tabla and that the tabla player was Muslim because the sitar the, the Hindu could not touch oh, a flesh skin. I see a, a skin yeah, I so the uh, but Anyway, it was sort of complicated, in my, and I was just wondering if you had I'm any... So, I wish I could tell you more. I don't. I, okay. I have no confidence in anything. And I shall so wander in the night. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so we got a couple minutes, and we're going to have to literally cut it at that point. But any comments? I'd love please, Greg. One of your opening statements uh, about... Buddha, you know, Buddhism being a missionary. Yeah, thing, yes, um, yes, yeah. I don't know how right. you finish that statement. But that was news to me. Right. Like that, that is not yeah. the Buddhism I grew up with. Right, right. So it's, a, like, it's already startling. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, when my ears perk up. Um, I happen to know a little bit about Ashoka, and, um, and, and I'm. I'm I'm gathering your fundamental question, which I understand is, does Buddhism have something to offer our society to shift how we are in the world right, together? Yeah, right. and, and I got Ashoka's story, which is kind of, in a way, it's top-down yep. government. Sure, absolutely. I decide absolutely. this for all of us. Right, absolutely. And, and, and where we are, where I understand us are in a more democratic sure. situation. Yeah. And sometimes if the question is, uh, can we as a democracy vote to have compassion as an underlying or foundational element of our government? Yeah. I would say no. Yeah. Sometimes I'd say yes, like after listening to you tonight. But uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still angling to answer your question about Buddhism and offering something of value right. to yep. society. The interesting thing is that in this study, I realized that you know, if Buddhism can offer something. Clearly, we're talking a long. We're talking long term. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two is that the question is how to go beyond Buddhism to other traditions, and is the future an interfaith collaboration at the highest order? And you know, I, I think, and that's where I have actually moved in terms of this idea of interspirituality. And what are those commonalities among these very different, these religions are different. You know, when there is a God, you know, the Father or uh, Allah, it's yeah. different than. Um, 
And so for me, in many ways, you know, how do I inform my life at the end of the day, even if this is not going to go anywhere, how do I live my life as a political person and, you know, trying to realize this practice here, so. I hate to say, just, I, I only say this because we've, this is the third time around, I've just kept everyone. I'd love to talk afterwards, but we have to sort of, we have to move, Maria's got, anyways, we got to wrap it up, so. Um, can we talk afterwards? I apologize. That's totally Anyways, it's been an honor, a pleasure, and uh, <laughs> to see you again. And then we'll thank you as always. You do such a beautiful job. Mm -hmm.